Okay, we have only 19 uh, people here at the moment, but if I could just go through the process, we have three um, sets of papers, um, all from UCT. So decentering the tutor, uh, Luna August who is here and will start. Um, then incorporating monitoring and evaluation practices, always one of the most difficult things to do. And that is Polite and Duru and Riyash and Sittledeen, followed by student reflections on student participation by Precious, Achlalela, Makatsu Sebatoma, and Riyash and Sittledeen. You've each got um, half an hour. I will alert you at five minutes if you have not stopped by then to allow for questions. Um, I would encourage the uh, participants to post their questions in case there is no question time. We don't want to be um, running into one another's space and time. So uh, we will try and stop at the, the times indicated and start the next paper at that time. So if I might then introduce uh, Luna August, we um, have had the opportunity to look at the abstract and we're looking at decentering the tutor. Um, Luna, would you like to start, please? And you are sharing. Um... Sure, definitely. I will um, put on my camera now as well. I just need to share my um, screen um, with you. Um, cool. Um, can you see my screen? I can see it. Um, okay, awesome. I, I just need to, um, if I go to present a view, I just want to be sure that you can't see my notes. Um, yeah, um, I'm in present view now, but you still just see my screen. I just yeah. see your screen. Okay, awesome. And I think the last thing that's left for me to do is just to switch on my camera. Um, so morning, <laughs> morning colleagues, it's, it's good to be here. Thank you so, so much for the opportunity to present this morning. I'll be presenting around um, decentering the tutorial space uh, uh, for, for student success or the impact that had uh, decentering the, tu the tutorial space and what impact that had on, uh, on student success. Um, so I, um, uh, I'm always open to input and, and things like that. Um, if you see anything or hear anything that appeals to you or want to make a quick note of something, you're welcome to just go to your browser on whatever device you are using um, and to go to um, that Bitly link. I wish that I can put it in the chat. I wanted to put it in the chat, but it's um, it's a Bitly link. It's descent to the tutor today. It will take you to WooClap. And um, if you have any contributions or anything that that um, uh, stands out to you, you're welcome to just up, 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 up populate it there. Uh, when you get there, um, there is um, the interface would look something like this. Um, um, there are three different provocations that you can enter some thoughts into and to alternate between, or to go between the different provocations, you use the drop down list to um, to 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 uh, to go to that specific provocation. So just again, the link it's bitly um, forward slash or bit.ly forward slash decenter the tu the tutor today. If any one of my colleagues from UCT could perhaps assist by just putting that link into the chat, I would really, really appreciate that. Cool. So, okay, I'm going to give you some context just to um, just to understand, just to just so that you can understand the viewpoints and the positionality that I'm speaking from today. So during 2020 and 2021, I worked as both a student leader serving in the Students' Representative Council, um, which we know from the Higher Education Act um, as being the um, as as being um, the highest uh, body of student leadership um, at any university, at least in South Africa. And during this time, I was also submerged in postgraduate studies. Um, I was doing a BA honors in theater and performance at the time. And then last year, I did the proposal portion of, of a research MA in theater as well. And then I tutored extensively on um, two courses in 2020 and uh, on, <coughs> sorry, 
two courses in 2020 and nine courses in 2021. And these tutorials took place in an online platform, which was Zoom. But very soon into tutoring, I noticed that I can't offer the same kind of tutorial space that I was exposed to as an undergraduate student. Student and my experience of 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 of, of being a, a, a tattling as they call it in 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 a tutor space was it was unidirectional tutoring sometimes reinforcing what Paulo Freire um calls the banking concept of the banking model of education and it speaks to this kind of hierarchy between the tutor and the student but here was an opportunity for me to be conscious of the environments that students are engaging um, with academics in, given that it was COVID-19, um, and majority of teaching and learning was still taking place through online platforms. Um, from a workshop that I attended, I remember the facilitators specifically speaking to tutors as not just providing academic support anymore. And in the COVID-19 context, this had shifted and extended into other areas, um, such as providing wellness support and digital literacy support. Um, Dina Beluigi um, was, was an academic, I think is still an academic, I'm not sure, at Rhodes or University, currently known at, at, um, as Rhodes, wrote this um, chapter on provoking ethical relationships, uh, which speaks to um, and, and speaks to teachers approaching teaching and learning relationships by mimicking the way that they were taught or the way that they learned. This kind of provided me with a starting point for my thinking, but with some introspection and reflection, the choice that I made was to not uphold the teaching styles that, that I've experienced. Um, and uh, there's always been this need for me to dismantle, you know, the classroom space and tutoring was my opportunity to do so. So in this, in this presentation today, I'm looking at acts of productive decentering and recentering um, that took place in the online theater and performance tutorial space. Um, Beluigi speaks to uh, a productive decentering as, as comprising a set of referential tools that a practitioner or a teacher in this case, uh, or in this case, a tutor um, uh, that that a tutor uses to decenter themselves. And specifically, this presentation looks at decentering um, the self as um, uh, de decentering the tutor as the self, a renegotiation of the relationship between the student and the tutor, and then also recentering the tutorial space through peer led interaction and engagement. And this is important because the tutorial space and by extension, the the the, the teaching and learning environment that students um, are exposed to. Um, has an impact on on their on their well being and 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 their belonging and ultimately student success. Um, just a reminder that I invite you to populate any of your thoughts in the WOOCLAP uh, link. Um, and I don't know if the link has been shared in the chat, but yeah, cool, um, awesome. So to obtain data for the presentation, it was important for me to get data or feedback from the, from students that I had tutored. And these were given to me in multi in multimodal formats, um, including text and audio. Um, uh, they are also, I've also interspersed some of them in the presentation. So you have to, so you get to listen to some of the student voices. Um, the, the audio responses were, were, were rendered and edited via uh, open source audio um, editing software program and also students were given the opportunity to or the option of creating avatars for themselves and to give themselves um, a name and a choose and they chose how to represent themselves um, the students who opted to participate were students that i tutored in different courses uh, meaning that they did not necessarily come from the same course and even in you know in this process of obtaining data, there was a bit of there was equity in how the students could represent themselves. And this process was also explained to them via an Instagram reel um, with guidance on how to create the avatar. So they were exposed to um, new technologies via a relatable platform as well. Um, yeah. So we'll listen to um, an initial contribution from some of our um, students. I thought tutor was there to be an extension of the lecturer and the tutor was there to break down and simplify the content that the lecturer was teaching at the time. The tutor was there to um, give attention and assistance to the students in a smaller group. A tutor, a tutor is more of like, a, I, I viewed it as a person who's like, I, I, it's someone that's like, I engage with the work and I can tell you what it's about based on, and based on like, you know, their understanding and maybe, the, and they're the ones that actually have the time to go through things even slower because 
we all learn in different speeds. So the tutor is just there to make sure that, you know, there's no panic. Just to give you some context, I mean, I hope you heard that uh, it was one of the first questions that I asked my uh, respondents was um, how did they construct, you know, the tutor or in their view what a tutor um, was to them as they started the university journey and, and those were some of their responses there. So uh, a key step towards decentering myself as a tutor was an inward reflection in terms of constructing my identity in the higher education space. And what are the facts about me that I know so far as I'm, I'm a learning designer, I'm a tutor, and I'm a facilitator, and my, my process in planning and facilitating a learning experience um, is informed by, by the trauma of my schooling experience. And this was because of the barriers to include um, the barriers to inclusion that I faced um, primarily by virtue of my sexuality and my gender identity and how in the schooling space I couldn't express myself fully. Um, there was also an impact on uh, my experience of education, um, uh, of higher education, uh, because schooling didn't entirely prepare me for university. And um, uh, more so, I came to university as an adult uh, six or so years after, after finishing, you know, finishing high school. And because of this, I was, an, I was at an extreme disconnect. Um, um, I was at an extreme disconnect and the kind of education and experience with learning environments that I encountered at university heightened the kind of social exclusion that I felt. And I struggled to integrate fully into the learning environment. And in, in, the, in that same instance, I faced many of the same challenges that um, students um, that, that the students face, particularly considering um, you know, the socioeconomic context and things that, that, that prevail in South Africa, also considering our history. So using the insights here and also um, um, the insights that are obtained from, 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 from Bede Ouija, um, and in trying to decentering the tutor, there's a negotiation that needs to take place between um, you know, my subjectivities as a tutor and also the responsibilities that I hold in the teaching and learning process. And this negotiation takes place by asking some of the questions that you see on the screen. How am I constituted in this context? How do I construct my students? How do students const construct these roles? And in which way can I create learning spaces that challenge and re-script? Um, the role of, 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 of a tutor um, uh, in the tutorial space. So how am I constituted? Yes, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a human um, they, uh, who faced barriers to education myself, as I've mentioned. There's also the gender barrier because I'm a woman of transgender experience and that obviously comes with its own set of struggles. And likewise, I also needed the very same conceptual assistance that students um, may have needed in, 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 in the tutorial space. In fact, I actually failed um, one of the courses that I years later ended up being a tutor in. And even though I've been through, you know, the theater and dance studies major and the honors and half of the master's degree uh, with tutoring in basically all of the theory courses that, that the department offered, I cannot claim to fully um, know what happens conceptually. And students in my tutorial care have shown to be able to um, help even me understand some concepts more clearly. And there was like this co-constructed learning environment that took place. But to take it a step further in this realm, colleagues, um, um, Kasturi Baharilik and others um, in, uh, in a 2019 study that speaks to, you know, that encourages a, a pedagogy of vulnerability, um, uh, asks us to render vulnerability to our frames of knowing, our frames of being, our frames of uh, feeling, our frames of doing, and linking back this back to my experience, this speaks to um, this is exactly what speaks to decentering the tutor. Apart from uh, encouraging vulnerability in the tutorial space, I, I outright um, during the contracting sessions at the start of courses disclosed my positionality to students just as I disclosed my positionality to you here today, colleagues. And um, this power in centering a learning experience around the disclosure of our positionalities, it opens up the space for difficult conversations to take place in the tutorial space, particularly around background and privilege and the views that we come into a tutorial or classroom space with and this brings about the collective need to disrupt or act differently as 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 the authors as the authors um say or allude to um in the tutorial space you know this manifested in different ways um as i was open about my positionality and vulnerabilities many students took up the offer to disclose certain vulnerabilities as well 
And a result was that, um, another result was that I personally overcame a lot of barriers to speaking academically or having that academic verbosity. Um, uh, and uh, because I often deal with, you know, imposter syndrome, um, even in the tutoring space. Um, but um, this didn't happen, um, you know, as time went on in the tutorial space because there was a collective understanding that we are all here to learn and we are all here to learn from each other and also it gave students greater confidence um, to take ownership of, of their learning so my my key provocation to you today colleagues or one of my key provocations to you is that if we undergo processes of negotiating and constructing um, our positionalities and and framing and reframing ourselves as vulnerable and humane, and to bring that into the teaching space, what would it mean for our students to encounter such a learning space? And of course, my um, my view then my view is that it gives, uh, in my experience, it gave students a greater sense of um, a citizenship in the learning space, uh, contributed to a greater sense of belonging, and and led to successful outcomes at least in the in some of the courses that I that I tutored at. Um, but of course, the students have something to say as well on how their view of a tutor changed after encountering me. We were able to actually express how we actually were feeling that day and get through with it before actually even touching upon material. So once we did touch on material, each and every one of us was literally treated in such a way of like it felt as though it was just Luna and us that that and and the two T that's just doing it. That's the kind of relationship that has developed. And yeah. To, and therefore, because there was no hierarchy that I felt or anyone had felt, I believe, it made tutoring sessions with Luna actually pretty entertaining. was more helpful in terms of how she planned everything and created activities for the tutorial group. She didn't tutor in a liquor style. She made it more, um, more interesting and creative. Um, one of the... Um... Respondent Sianda on the um Sianda made a very interesting um 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 um, um self representation um and where they view the tutor as as a professional and I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as I as I as I speak um to decentering the tutor in relation to students. So my my teaching philosophy stems from a deep decolonial approach that was informed by my political conscientization when I was involved in student leadership and governance. And I was often confronted with many emails, actually an inbox that exploded with queries um, with students asking me for support. And a key consideration for me then as a tutor was not to replicate the conditions that many students had outlined in the emails, which were often very, very graphic. Um, and yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, my my my, my uh, the emails I received from students were sometimes very very graphic. And in my experience, the best learning environment is one where the teacher is one that is approachable is is approachable, and the best learning environment is one where there is a level of consciousness as to the what the daily and loved struggles of students are. And this immensely set the tone for how I interacted with students in my care. Um, Les Langer uh, argues that the decolonial turn in higher education uh, led to a process of deauthorizing the university and pushes the South African university to a place where it begins to recognize itself as, as being on the border. And this border is viewed as a place of possibility. It's, it's, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly growing, and it's constantly knowing for, um, constantly looking for new insight and constantly looking for new ways to change. Um, Komalo and Reddy also, um, in, in that same book, actually, uh, asks us as practitioners to focus our attention to the precariousness of, of, of what it is to be on the border. And some of the ways to di dissect this precarity is through our pedagogy and how it supports student belonging and cultivation of citizenship in the university space. Because of this, it was critical that I do not perpetuate the hegemonic view of what of what a tutor was. And this encompassed a process of actively being available for student concerns at very erratic hours sometimes. But I must say that um, this is what I'm comfortable with. And, and if you are listening and taking away any points from my presentation, please don't think that this is something that I'm actively pushing onto your and advocating for, because it does come with some light boundary setting, particularly at the start of a course or a semester.
But my tutoring practice also encompassed a, a conscious effort uh, to, to be relatable to student needs and concerns. And I think that to an extent, my experience as a then postgraduate student and recently then also having finished an undergrad and being in the SRC um, aided with this. But colleagues, we are all unique and some of you may relate to this. Um, I want to reflect on this as having been my experience with, you know, negotiating with the border that, that Langa and others speak to. And the pandemic um, with online learning or emergency remote teaching or physically distance learning or whatever your institution called it. And its impact of, of, of um, that it had on the human condition provided me and arguably many of us with an opportunity to consider how we interact and engage with students and how to disrupt the hegemonic view of what a tutor or teacher is. But also um, encompassed actively listening to student feedback beyond just um, evaluating, you know, courses at the end of the semester. Um, students also want to contribute to the design of courses. They want to, they want their well-being considered when, when courses are being designed and when course and module outlines are being typed up. Um, because students are partners in the learning experience and citizens in the learning space, things like assignment deadlines, et cetera, et cetera, that needs to be negotiated with them. And a decentering of the tutor also um, uh, took place by dismantling the hierarchy in, 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 in the space, um, uh, which ties into you know, some earlier points around, around vulnerability that I made. And in cultivating and, and cultivating a democratic environment in the space. And the students actually have something to say on this as well. Luna made sure to emphasize on the fact that there is no hierarchy among us. Therefore, it made it more democratic and enabled more of the students to to voice how they feel about certain things, which was which is really, really great. And there was no decision that was that Luna made that was all by herself. It was more of a matter of if there was something that we wanted or needed to do as a group, every single person would have to have a say in it and what times work. Obviously, this also goes for one-on-one -on -one sessions and so on. It's always open to questions. She ensured that everyone's opinion was heard. She allowed the students to also take the lead during some of the sessions, such as summarizing a topic from the perspective so this um then brings me to my second con um a provocation colleagues what would it mean to the students in your care if you were their professional friend what if we recenter the, the student as an active agent and partner in their learning and approaching them as such and what if students were invited to contribute towards the the, the design or redesign of particular courses. The decolonial turn in higher education has created opportunities for us to reconsider our approach to teaching and learning. And in my experience, adopting some of these strategies um, has, um, adopting some of these strategies has contributed positively to students and how they view the tutorial space and further um, foster student success. Um, so looking at the uh, uh, the recentering between uh, uh, so looking at the recentering between uh, the students and peers, it was important for me as facilitator and tutor to facilitate community building uh, between the students as the um, classroom space um, um, in the classroom space. Um, and this light bulb moment that I had here was not anything new or innovative. There's always been a need for, for, um, for us to build community in classroom spaces between peers, between the students and the tutor and so on. But it's something that's often taken for granted. But here there was um, even more of a need to foster community because we were bounded by a common constraint, which was or still is the pandemic. And realistically for some, getting through online learning was easier for others. Um, however, in a context where there is a, a responsibility for all of, for us to engage in teach in the teaching and learning activity and to engage with the university calendar, which uh, which really waits for no one, how do we then recenter um, peer engagement and support as a st success strategy? Um, um, yeah, how do we engage with uh, a yeah, how do we engage with 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 peer support with with peer engagement in a as a success as a success strategy? Um, it played out in various ways in the tutorial space. Um, peer and and uh, 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 
took place as, you know, peer and group activities where there was a randomized partnering where I adopted this approach of, you know, spinning an online wheel. Um, so there was no control or thinking in like, you know, who works together. And in that way, different students were, um, were, 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 were roped together. And uh, Twitter was, Twitter was also actually used as a space for reflection. Um, uh, students had the opportunity to create. You have five yes. minutes. Thank sure, you. Sure, cool. So Twitter was used as a space to uh, for reflection. Uh, students had the opportunity to create anonymized accounts and they were encouraged to, you know, tweet at least uh, three tweets at the end of every tutorial uh, to, to reflect on what that week was like. And this was an interactive space um, uh, where students could follow each other and interact with each other's tweets. And students could also make use of the full offering uh, that Twitter had when they submitted their reflections. Um, we also encouraged, or rather I encouraged, you know, approaching group work in a project management style where groups could have, um, they could have, you know, I encouraged, you know, project mapping meetings where they outline what they're all bring to the table in a group work setting. And uh, as tutor, I was available to, to mediate any conflicts which may have existed, but none was reported to me. Um, uh, uh, I also encouraged, you know, group debriefs of, of, the, of the group work so that if there was any, you know, harshness in, in a group that it doesn't, you know, spill over into the tutorial space. Um, and then also in one of the tutorial groups, the tutorial space became a very big debrief space. And it was amazing to witness how students felt so comfortable, um, so comfortable to speak so openly. And this was a happy space. This space was also, it seemed to be a very happy space. And uh, um, uh, one of the students actually have something to say on this. I think it's in the last voice note. Um, yeah, there is a, a one more voice note that I'm going to play where they actually speak on this. But it goes without saying then, um, colleagues, that um, we need to increasingly come up with innovative ways to enhance the student experience. And therefore, my final provocation to you is, um, uh, my final provocation to you uh, asks the question of, uh, what uh, it would mean for student success if conscious efforts were undertaken to foster peer-led learning, peer engagement, and peer support in the tutorial um, in the tutorial space or the teaching and learning space. And in the tutorial space, I found it to be a process that didn't need much facilitation. Um, and if that sense of community was fostered right at the start, the community would, you know, form naturally. And if we made an intentional effort to plan for community building and peer interaction in our course design, then it would foster, it, it would uh, contribute towards fostering student success and retention. So just to wrap up some of the key points that I made in my presentation today, colleagues, um, decentering ourselves as, as academics, uh, tutors or teachers or whatever we call ourselves uh, by, by, by um, showing ourselves as vulnerable, humane, open to new understandings around disciplines, discourses, and the context in which we operate will definitely do wonders for, you know, the teaching and learning space. We are also at the board of creating at the board of creating change and we have an opportunity to be radical in our approach to course design. Um, this is through viewing the students as partners in the tutorial space uh, and in flattening the hierarchy that typically exists within teaching and learning spaces. Um, we also have an opportunity to extend this radical thought by being you know, intentional in offering students a seat at the table when courses are being designed and also co-created spaces are happier spaces. Um, if courses were, you know, equitably and inclusively designed, one could only imagine what it would mean for student um, retention and success. And then the last point that I want to make is there are greater chances at student success and retention if we recenter teaching and learning interactions to have greater um, peer engagement and interaction and to be intentional about this in our course design. But the final word is also from the students. It would make me feel included and make me feel that my opinion or perspective matters. So I would think it would really make me excited. And what are some of the ways that I think that I can contribute towards the way courses are designed? Um, I believe that every single person is always open to an opportunity of learning, including the lectures. So if there would be some form of democracies between learners and lectures, in some shape, form, um, in terms of schedules and what is offered within the course, 
I definitely think that that relationship should be established. Tutorials with Luna, I used the roadmap tutorial session to plan my work for the specific week and it allowed me to become a better um, at time management. I was also able to formulate questions from the content and ask for clarification during tutorial sessions. One thing within being in a tutorial with Luna that you can take responsibility of, I can definitely say is is you. You you take ownership of of yourself so luna will always be open to ask questions about how we are feeling what is it that we do not understand about a certain section um and i just believe it's all about you it's all about you taking it upon yourself to actually ask a question and luna will be lit will be keen on answering that question regardless of how long that the question might be it may be checking an essay draft it may be that you didn't understand a particular thing in the material that you did in the week cool that is it colleagues thank you so so much thank you very much indeed um luna there are a couple of questions in the um, chat um which you might like to answer there but we do need to move on to the next presentation um, which is incorporating monitoring and evaluation practices as part of educational intervention planning from theory to practice. And this is Pilat Nduru and Ryashna Sittledeen. Colleagues, if you would like to start your presentation. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> Confirm you can see my screen. Colleagues, uh, please confirm if you can see my screen. Yes. We can okay. see it, but it's not in, there we go, it's in uh, slide mode now. All right, sure. Thank you. So uh, the, the topic is incorporating monitoring and evaluation practices as part of uh, educational intervention planning, a case study. Uh, in this talk, I'll cover a bit of an introduction, an in introduction then move to the case description, which is Pambili, a project that's uh, rolled out at UCT. And then I'll look at the theoretical evaluation models that are available in education and then zero in on one model that we picked for uh, as our case for our case study. And then we'll then operationalize this theoretical model and look at the emergent types of evaluations coming out of the, the, uh, the model. Then we'll reflect using this, the model that we have chosen using um, our Pambili project. And then I'll conclude by looking at lessons learned from this. So the design and implementation of new and sometimes uh, experimental interventions in higher education are usually engaged with just the immediate objective in mind as op opposed to developing a long-term strategy for sustainability and scalability if the intervention is indeed successful at meeting its objective. The result is that many promising interventions are eventually dropped, usually due to a lack of data to support its claims of efficacy, which impacts ability uh, to secure more resources to continue. This has been particularly true in emergency situations such as the one that we find ourselves related to the COVID pandemic and the switch to emergency remote learning. We need to be able to design interventions for long-term sustainability and scalability, which requires that we are able to monitor the interventions as we go, reflect on ways on improving the intervention and evaluate its impact with each iteration. This requires having um, conceptual evaluation frameworks set up for the intervention for, for right from the beginning. This allows for the optimal use of often limited uh, resources and continuous improvement with each iteration. Uh, our case description is uh, the case. It's a project that was launched at GCT called Pambili, 
which literally translates to forward. So in addressing the challenges and disruptions brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic over the last two years, UCT launched the Pambili project, which was aimed at supporting teaching and for, for students to, to achieve academic success. The program supplements the general and discipline specific support provided by faculties that exist already. For some students and certain faculties, the program is mandatory and for others, it is optional. It is mandatory for those that, um, that, did, that uh, were deemed would have otherwise been excluded on academic grounds. So these are students that were, had their progression, didn't meet the allowed progression uh, category. And then it's optional for those that had uh, concessions from their faculties. The primary aim of the programs are to emphasize student agency and responsibility in their success, to enable access to institutional resources and support and help students develop individual plans for recovery. The program's specific objectives are to motivate students to reconnect with their studies, to set out the expectations that the university has of the students in this particular cohort, to highlight the responsibility that students have for their own success, and then to encourage students to reassess the goals and aspirations that brought them into university. And then to strengthen students' help seeking behavior and confidence in their own agency. In other words, to develop student agency. And then to emphasize a culture of care within the University of Cape Town. And then to emphasize UCT's commitment to enabling student success. And also to connect students to sources of information and support that may, be, may help with confronting the challenges that they are facing. And then explore the challenges that students experienced in the years before for redesigning of next year's program. And in terms of uh, the program activities, um, the program started with an orientation at launch and it planned to have two peer group facilitated sessions for each semester. And it's established points of contact with curriculum advisors in the faculties were available throughout the year. It draws on the insights, materials, and training capacity of developmental advisors and developmental staff situated in the different faculties across the university. It ties into the central advising referral services, which we refer to as CARES network, uh, to inform and refer students to appropriate support structures. It has trained and mobilized a cohort of peer advisors. So the Pambili project was launched on the 8th of March in 2022. And um, okay, so that's about the description of the, pro of the project itself. Now moving on to the theoretical evaluation models in education. Before I do that, I just need to define a few terms that are relevant. Here, when we say evaluation, according to Rossi and Lipsy, it is the use of social research methods to systematically investigate the effectiveness of social intervention programs in ways that are adapted to their political and organizational environments and are designed to inform social actions in ways that improve the social conditions. Uh, the main objective of carrying out an evaluation is to uh, achieve social betterment to which evaluation can, be, can contribute by assisting democratic institution to better select, oversee, improve, and make sense of social programs and policies. Uh, it's also the assessment of a coherent set of activities aimed at bringing about a change in people or their circumstances. A review of literature shows that there are many models that are available. But however, the following four seem to be the key ones. There is uh, one model called uh, Tyler's Objective Model, another one called Stakes Responsive Model, and another one called Scriven's Goal Free Model. And uh, the one that is, uh, I'm going to adopt is called the Context Input Process Product 
a model uh, developed by Stafford and, and colleagues. Uh, the objective model, as it states, it focuses more on having an objective right at the start of the, of the, of the intervention and then evaluating whether that objective has been, has been achieved at the end of the, of the, of the intervention. And then a uh, stakes response model really looks at all the voices and opinions of the stakeholders that are involved in the project and then tries to evaluate taking that uh, all those opinions in, 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 into account. Then uh, Scriven's goal free model, it, it's based on the assumption that we do not really know uh, all the objectives of the intervention. There are some in some, some objectives that are emergent that we also need to take into account for. Then the SIP model, which I'll go into detail a little bit more here, is a bit more comprehensive than the three that I've just described. And it has been operationalized in practice through various guides. And these are regularly being updated. It is useful for both formative and summative evaluation. So formative is when you are just starting out the, the, the intervention, you are looking at how you can improve that offering. You look at uh, the formative aspects of the evaluation. And then summative is mostly to fix to accountability for the stakeholders that are involved in the, in the project. And it's usually conducted right at the end of the evaluation itself. So this table gives you uh, a summary of the SIP model. And you've got four dimensions, the context, the input, the process, and the product, which makes up the SIP. Um, under the context, we are looking at context evaluation, which deals with assessing the needs, problems, and opportunities within a defined environment. And there are various ways or tools that are available want to do that, including doing survey, uh, document review, data analysis, hearings, interviews, diagnostic tests, and so forth. In the input phase, this is used to evaluate competing strategies, the work plans, and the budgets for the strategies chosen to implement programs or projects. And again, there are various tools that one can employ to, 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 to carry out this type of evaluation. And then the process evaluation is used to monitor and assess activities carried out during programs or projects in implementation. And then lastly, the product evaluation. It helps to identify and evaluate short-term, long-term, intended or unintended consequences of programs or projects. Now, how do we operationalize this model? One operationalization of this model is by Ross and Lipsy, who look at, uh, at it in a, in, a, in a stepwise model. Um, right at the bottom, which matches the context, is what is called the assessment of the need for the program. So this is really looking at the context and assessing whether there is a need for the program that you're about to run. So if you are undertaking an evaluation of that sort, then you are doing what is called the need evaluation. And then the next uh, assessment in, involves assessing the program design and theory of change. And a theory of change is simply a description of the mechanisms by which the program is expected to achieve its effects. A program theory can be expressed in a narrative or picture, or it can be depicted in a simple logic uh, model. Uh, a program theory can articulate processes and impact mechanisms. If you're looking at the processes, you are looking at the process uh, theory evaluation. If you're looking at the impact, you're looking at the impact theory evaluation. And then next is the program process and implementation uh, evaluation. And then, um, uh, uh, the next step, which looks at the context, involves both looking at program outcome and impact, and also looking at cost and efficiency of the program, project or program.
Then adopting the SIP model and looking at the family, what is it that we have done? So under context evaluation, we have done a review of UCT uh, performance data and, 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 and looked at various indicators. And then there was, we identified that there was a, a rather higher than usual student population that would have been academically excluded. And we also established that we have a diverse student okay, voice. I'm, I'm just in the background. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just need to keep an eye on I'm not status. presenting or anything, but I am assisting. So if there's a question or some issue coming in. Sorry, there's someone speaking. Institutional surveys conducted during COVID identified challenges that were a cause for concern uh, and which would contribute to student poor performance. So such issues as living arrangements, mental health, and so forth. So indeed, looking at the family, there was a need for the, for, the, for the project to be implemented. In terms of input evaluation, we took an inventory and analyzed the available human and material resources. And then we identify, we were able to identify support structures that already exist within the UCT in faculties, uh, such as the first year program, such as student advising, such as student housing, such as student finance, and leveraged on those to establish the program that was tailor-made to address the need. Also recruited peer advisors and mobilized the necessary financial and management support. Now in terms of process uh, evaluation, we are continuously monitoring families' potential procedural barriers and remaining alert to unanticipated ones. So we have in the process of, uh, as, as part of the, the project, we continuously monitor it and continuously revise it so that we have a better, a better offering to our students. And then as part of the monitoring, we do attend, we monitor the attendance and feedback that we get from our, our, our students in terms of whether the schedules are working for them and just a sense of the entire offering of the Pambil project. Then there's the possibility that we also might review the theories of change and document them uh, for all UCT interventions which are linked to Pambi. Um, and then in terms of the product evaluation, I think we have potential intermediate outcomes that we can start looking at. And the two that I think of is looking at um, Julie performance and first semester exam results. So DP is really performance where students would have met the submissions that are required per course so that they could write their exams. What have we learned through this process? So we noticed that there are advantages to using the, the or to think in evaluation terms and include a comprehensive understanding of the true value of what the intervention could offer. And it also allows us to make informed strategic, strategic decisions with confidence and grow capacity within the department for learning and inquiry. And the primary focus of the work is program growth and improvement instead of solely uh, focused on, uh, on accountability. And then uh, adopting the SIP model allows for flexibility to be incorporated as part of the offering. And thus we are able to change and adapt the program as, 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 as um, experience dictates. And then we also learned that there should be a core team of people who can commit to the process as it requires dedication over a long period of time. And the culture of the organization is one that is open to making mistakes and learning from them. Uh, we also learned that inclusion of key stakeholders ensures that the, in, the intervention uh, is successful. So you need people that will make decisions, you need to incorporate them, you need people that are directly affected by, by the offering to be also involved in, in your design. Uh, thank you, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Polite. You're very good. You left us 10 minutes for questions. 
Uh, we don't have any in the chat. Would people like to um, ask questions directly? Um, can I ask then, a polite, you know, a lot of universities have got very restricted resources. How resource intensive is this kind of intervention? Are you mean the Pambuli intervention or looking at yeah, the Pambuli intervention? Yeah. Um, so I think for UCT, I'll ask the other colleagues to also chip in. But I think for UCT, we had the advantage that uh, certain resources existed already. Uh, so for example, I mentioned the first year experience uh, that exists. Uh, there are also faculty-based uh, um, programs. And then we also have uh, academic advising that already exists. But the Pambili came in just to make sure that the students that were struggling in the previous years could be directed to those resources that are within UCT already. So what the additional resources that we needed were the additional uh, academic advisors and the co-management team that, that came in to, to, to manage the project. So essentially, I would say it's not a, a resource intensive if you already have the structures that are available. It's an issue of coordinating them uh, in such a way that they are more available, readily available, and students know how to uh, get, get assistance when they need it. So in our case, it's not as resource demanding as, as it would have been had it been that we didn't have these other programs that we are drawing from. I will ask the other colleagues that are involved here to add if I've missed out anything. Uh, in terms of yeah, Siri Ashna is ready to talk. <laughs> right. Can you hear me, Wendy? Yes, clearly. So um, I just want to want to sort of clarify some of the stuff that, that Pali said. He's, he's absolutely right in that part of the work that Pambili does is refer students to existing resources that, that exist within the institution. So part of the work is pro providing the connectivity there. However, in terms of the model that we've used, it is resource intensive in the sense of um, we use a peer advisor model. So the peer advisors themselves are recruited and of course one has to pay them for their time. And um, we spend a fair amount of time um, doing a very, we have a very structured approach to the curriculum that the peer advisors uh, impart with the students, as, and so they have to be trained into that curriculum. So we've taken on um, the, the constructs of appreciative advising and um, inquiry-based um, advising, strengths-based advising, that sort of thing. Where, again, polite is correct, the fact that we already had the academic advising project in place with its um, framework uh, that we've been developing over the last two years, we were very ready to go with a curriculum. Um, and so, so that in a sense is the resources and then there is management of the peer advisors and of the students. But we worked within where, the, where we saved on resources uh, and, and in terms of resource constraints is we worked um, within UCT sort of learn, we used the learning management platform. We used the available um, like software that we had in terms of developing uh, a little bit of a case management system and that sort of thing. So we really grabbed from a lot of existing resources and, and we put a few resources in, but we were able to, and that's how we were able to do it with a relatively small amount of money uh, as in its, for, in its pilot phase. Great, thank you. Thanks Any other sure. questions? Looks like everything is um, quite uh, clear to everyone. A very valuable practice, and I think monitoring and evaluation um, as a practice was quite clearly explained and, and set out in your presentation. So thank you very much, Polite. Uh, we Thank can you. then move on to the last presentation a little early. Um, I'm just going to see 
what we are dealing with here. Okay, this one is student reflections on student participation. What is the value of the student's voice and is it heard? So this is Precious Machlalela, uh, Demokatsu Sebatoma and Ryashna Sittaldin. So I don't know who's going to present, but whoever it is, could you um, Ah, oh, here we go. The thing is being set up for us. And who is presenting? Uh, good morning, Wendy. I will be presenting. It's Demokatsu. Okay, Demokatsu, thank you very much. With precious. Okay, great. You can go ahead. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm Dimakato. I will be presenting with Precious. And we worked with uh, Dr. Ryashna Sitaldin on this. Um, our presentation is students' reflection on student participation. What is the value of the student voice and is it heard? This, uh, this is how our presentation will be structured. I will start with the background and give you information on the initiative that included the student voice and Precious will do the second half of the presentation. She will indicate to you the method that we used and the feedback that we got from the students who participated in this event and then conclude. So from 2021, we coordinated events that promote, define, or measure student success. In the events, we had to ensure that we include the student voice because it is important to continuously engage with students in designing more relevant and impactful initiatives, especially those related to student success. Before we put this work together, we asked ourselves, um, what is the student voice? Why is it important? How we can include it and why uh, promote it? The student voice refers to the values, opinions, beliefs, interests, approaches, techniques, choices, and perspective of individual students. The student voice can also be in a collective and be represented in student-led councils or forums. It is important, the student voice is important because engaging the student voice is an essential strategy for institutions seeking to become more student-centered and inclusive. Several initiatives encourage and actively seek out student participation at every level from conception to implementation. The student participation is critical to the successful design of such initiatives because they are the ultimate beneficiaries and students are better equipped to inform this design and speak to its impact and limitations. Students should be partners in the design and planning of their success. They should have an active role. It is important to position students as co-creators in student success initi initiatives. No one can speak for students by themselves. It is essential to encourage students and support them in investing in themselves and informing their success. To support our work and carry it forward, we looked at literature and um, we also looked at the student voice in higher education, the importance of distinguishing student representation and student partnership. And these are some of the reflections that we found that uh, students felt that when they share responsibility for making things work, it's not all on the academic. It's an If the idea flops, it makes us feel more likely to turn up for class or it makes it more likely to turn up for class and prepare to work. Some of the students mentioned that we got listened to about our perspective on the course. And I think we were more involved and learned more because of it. And some of the academics reflected that my reflection was being st structured around what the students were saying. So I felt more accountable. I was forced to reflect on my practices because I had to go back to the students and either change my practices based on what they said or explain to them the reasons why I wasn't going to make changes. So this supported us that it, it made us see that it is important to 
promote the student voice. If the students are involved in decision-making processes, they realize their potential and they feel they are recognized through collaborative processes. The inclusion of the student voice must be part of a well thought out approach to student centeredness where engagement in structured representation is well thought out and the an integration of student feedback is deliberate. So these are some of the initiatives that included the student voice. The Siapumela Western Cape Regional Network uh, started a workshop series in 2021 and then <coughs> We've had two workshops already. Um, the first workshop was on defining student success and the other one was on measuring student success. This workshop had the student voice. We also have the, the data analytic for student success committee. DESK is responsible for the development of an institutional strategy for student success using data analytics. The committee has a student representative and uh, we lastly we had uh, the development of the data ethics framework workshops at the beginning of the year we had three workshops out of the three workshops two had student representatives um the workshops were on the ethics of using student data and um uh, precious will uh from here give you um the method that we used and the information that we got from the students um, thank you, Dimakato. As uh, she has mentioned, so we got students from the um, initiatives that she's mentioned to participate. So we did a follow up surveys with students that participated in those student initiative success initiatives. And from those students, we had two groups. We had students that were nominated, and these were students who were nominated as representative of specific committees and students that were approached. So an invite was sent out to a group of students and they took interest in the initiative and participated. So we had 80% of students who were approached and 20% of students that were nominated responding to our survey. So we ask students to just reflect on their participation because we wanted to get a sense of how we could get more from the student voice based on their experience. Um, and uh, we had a couple of points play out and what came out of the reflections. And one of them was that students should be able to prepare ahead of time. And, that was just so because it we got a sense of the students went aware of what was really a, what to expect when participating and uh, students suggested that it would be better to so they know the implication of their participation and what really is expected to them so they will be able to give more if they had an idea of what their participation meant and why, why it was important to participate in these initiatives. Um, another thing that came up was that we need we needed to approach or to to have a bigger reach. And we, so we need diversity in terms of faculties and academic backgrounds. So, and that would be just having a, trying to reach a larger group because then we get more feedback from a, from diver, from a diverse group of students than actually approaching uh, students that are categorized in the maybe same faculty or in doing the same co same uh, program. Um, next. And there was one other thing that came up was a lack of involvement of postgraduate students. And this was a concern because we also, this also came up in our regional network, the, the regional students, defining student success workshop that we had, where we found out that they was, it wasn't as easy to define student success for uh, postgraduate students compared to uh, undergraduate students. So involving more of the postgraduate student voice would actually be beneficial because they will be able to define and actually they will be 
I, it, there would be you integral into defining of student success for the stu postgraduate students. And uh, the last thing that came out from, uh, from the reflections was that exploring um, innovative avenues for cooperating student voices, because some student may not be uh, interested, for instance, in taking a survey or attending a workshop. So coming up with um, more innovative ways to have a better reach and make it more accessible to a larger group of students and one of the suggestions was the use of social media, which would actually have a better reach and gain more interest compared to a survey or a workshop. So what we were also interested on was to see whether students uh, actually received feedback after they, are part they participated in these initiatives because one of the things that we want to we want to do is to make sure that students feel like they are partners in shaping and actually the in, in shaping student success in the institution. So feed, getting feedback is one of the ways where they will feel like they are efforts are actually making a difference. So what we got is that 60% uh, of the students did receive actually received feedback in terms of minutes or a report after the workshop and 40% of the students did not get any feedback. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also want, we're interested in finding out whether students will be interested to participate in future student success um, or student where we need, participate in any initiative that actually required a student voice and would be able to contribute, will be willing to contribute. And we got that 60% of the students were willing to, uh, to participate in future initiatives. And uh, one of the comments that was, it was just the in, students were actually excited to see the genuine interest in the institution. And they actually felt like they were interested to see actually whether their contributions will be implemented in policy making of the institution. So that what gave in the, the um, more, willingness to participate in future initiatives while well, we had a, a split between 20% with others saying maybe and others saying they would definitely not uh, be participating. So just to conclude, um, we actually found that we the student voice should be viewed as partners in student success initiative because then it make them feel like that their input and their contributions are actually adding value and that student initiatives should be made available to a more diverse order, audience so that we get more out of the student, we can get more out of the student voice and that the um, integration of student feedback into the design of student success initiatives should be intentional. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Precious. Would one of the other two members of this particular team like to add anything before we open for general questions? Rashna or Demokatsu, if there's anything further you want to add? Um, so uh, may perhaps just to, to give the audience a little bit of a, a sense of, of, of why we wanted to start looking at this at UCT. Um, it was because we had, you know, we always told, and, and we know with Sia Pumalela, it's, it's a fundamental concept to include the student voice uh, very strongly, but I haven't really engaged with what does that mean in terms of, of, of having a set of guidelines for how you would include the student voice meaningfully. And, and be able to use that information uh, at a later stage. So this is where this piece of work sort of emerged from. 
and from a, a sort of in, internal space, that's where, where we will be taking this is setting up a set of guidelines for our own practices when we have committees, when we invite students into committees for them to have a sense of what is going to be expected of them going forward. And hopefully this will improve the quality of the engagement. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I posted a couple of que uh, questions myself in the um, chat. Um, if there are very few students in a group comprising senior staff members, do they feel intimidated? Do they feel their voice is lost? Um, and I think most students who are included are in fact SRC members, which is good. Um, but then how do the other students feel? How do you find out? How do you give them a voice? Well, Russian. I mean, if I may, yeah. So uh, uh, Dimakatso or, or uh, Precious, also please jump in if you like, if you if you have something to add. So, I mean, I would say, you know, we were heard in the earlier presentation by Luna, this issue of imposter syndrome, you know, and that we feel as academics sitting in a room full of professors. I can only imagine what students feel in that, in that case. One thing that's been quite um, uh, useful in, um, in, in some of the meetings that I've, I've sat in is when you call on the students directly. So there is a very, there's a, you make sure you actually call on the students. My one concern actually at UCT is we often only get SRC students um, in, represented on these committees. And I would like to see as uh, Precious was referring to a more diverse group of students, um, that engage in this kind of leadership. Uh, and that's something we want to explore a bit more as well in our space. But Dimakatsu and um, Precious. Um, thank you, Rajna. Um, one of the students um, who um, we had a, a, an informal conversation with um, did indicate to us that um, when they first got the minutes and realized who is sitting on the committee, they got nervous. But I must say the student is very active in the in the committee, speaks out. So I think um, he felt, uh, he does feel that um, he his views are being taken into consideration and he doesn't feel intimidated in the group. Even though at the beginning he indicated that um, just seeing the minutes and seeing who's um, in the meeting really uh, got him. But yeah, I think he is doing okay. Um, I put in the um, chat earlier when we were listening to the first presentation, um, a, a chapter in, in a book uh, by Hunt and Chalmers called University Teaching in Focus. Um, and it's about pedagogical partnerships and engaging with students as co-creators of curriculum assessment and knowledge. Um, and it's, it's actually, it makes quite interesting reading because it's the importance of the academic relationships um, in student retention and success, both the teacher-student relationship and the student-student relationship. And students having more agency and, and in that way being more capable of dealing with a complex future. Um, and it's, it's got some excellent case studies in it of how they involve students in uh, various groups, but of course acknowledging that it's a challenge when you have very large classes um, to be inclusive about your involvement because you can only involve relatively small numbers of students with an academic um, and you might have a class of 1800 economic, economics one students and then how do you, do you do that? But it is quite an interesting chapter for this particular um, session that we've just had, both for the first presentation and this one, about involving students, giving them voice, um, making them take agency, um, making them co-create, um, and not just involving them like the SRC in, in meetings. So it's something that we um, could look at. Um, in the um, chat, we also have a question from Victor in reflecting on the feedback from students. How did you deal with the issue of whose voice is heard? 
one of the team would like to answer that. I'll leave that one to Dimokatsu. Um, I think uh, to say whose voice is heard, it's it's a bit early, and also we were hoping to do focus groups with students, and um, and our initiatives are still continuing. But we were um, we were comforted knowing that our students felt that um, those who received feedback, um, their views were reflected in the reports or the minutes. So I think it's something it's it's continuing. We we can't say at the moment that for sure whose voice if the student's voice is being heard but they indicated that they could see that their views were reflected in in the reports or the minutes that they received okay thank you um could i ask all three um sets of pre presenters if there were any questions to any of them that you missed out on asking earlier but would like to ask now which we do have a few minutes you could raise your hands there by the reactions button. Um, it gives you a, a raise hand opportunity. And I see Tony has put the um, reference to the book I mentioned in the chat as well. Okay, if there are no more questions and no more discussions, can I thank all three sets of presenters? I think that um, they gave us a very good idea of some of the things that are happening at the University of Cape Town. Um, and we're going to hear more as the conference goes on over the next couple of days. They've um, put in um, a number of papers, so we're going to get a very well rounded in the end idea of the kinds of initiatives being undertaken at the University of Cape Town and congratulations to all of you for the efforts you have made. Um, and I see there's a um, comment saying um, very interesting presentations from all new views and ways of being for a changing environment, exciting. So on that note, thank you University of Cape Town presenters. It was exciting. And we can all go off to lunch and come back at three o'clock for the next, um, the, the restart of the sessions. If you wanted to join another group now, some of them are going on till 10 past 12. Oh, I see Polite, you've got your hand up. There is a session from 11.40 to, oh no, that's just the paper that I wanted to see. <laughs> oh yeah, there, 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 are, there are sessions going on, um, other sessions that are continuing till 10 past 12 where they had four, four papers. So if you want to go and join one of those and not take an early lunch, please do so. And Tony, thank you very much for your assistance and our um, also our technical support in the background. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.